You don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me. You don't know me. (laughs) So, you can hear we have Kyle here. Welcome out to You Don't Know Me. Welcome out to You Don't Know Me. (laughs) You don't know me. Isn't that... (laughs) Is that what they? Is that what, is that what she says in Rick and Morty? Though, isn't that actually what she? Yes, says? yes! <laughs> that was an unintentional. Ge- Good job, you did that on purpose. Totally. Good job. Uh, you don't know me, but welcome out to you don't know me. <laughs> I'm with you don't know me, Nick. You don't know me, and with me is you don't know me, Kyle. Sup? <laughs> <laughs> or or you know, uh, stay tuned. I hope you enjoyed our last episode. You don't know me, Deborah. <laughs> 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 off the rails so early <laughs> yes uh, check out our sponsors Pack Rat Comics uh, you can also check out the Magic Unauthorized Misadventures of Rocky and Boinko at gbgpresentspod.com which we are uh, for more information check out stay tuned to that website we're going to have updates on our last live show of second season um, and then when the show comes back out uh, also both also, also both what the also fuck bo- take a drink Jesus Christ uh, if you don't know what that means uh Check out – and that's the thing. We talk about this all the time. We don't really talk about where to go. There's an episode called The GBG Drinking Game mm-hmm. uh, for those who are stumbling upon us because you are a fan of Steve Martin because we're going to talk about Shop Girl, but more on that in a second. Uh, Nick says words wrong a lot uh, and random talks about weird Ninja Turtle shit. This doesn't count right <laughs> now. Uh, check out that episode and there's drinking instructions. So mm-hmm. if you want to enjoy your full bottle of apple juice or like a big boy, some whiskey – uh, or beer, um, and but you're going to get drunk. Trust me. Uh, it, there's the drinking game, um, and uh, but seriously though, if you we get some money kicked back from Audible, go to audibletrial.com. Oh, look, this works out perfectly. You can get Shop Girl. I'm sure it's read by Steve Martin. If not, you can get bored. I know for sure you can get born standing up because they have over 200,000 titles to choose from. Kyle, what? Uh, yeah, that's right, 200,000 titles to choose from. What? Which is, and I know for sure they have Sting. Uh, Sting. Sting wrote a book? No. <laughs> I was sorry. Should I say Stephen King's it? <laughs> just boom. And there's no even ing. It's just sti- it. sting. Sting. Sti- Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, yeah. You're already down. You should be down half a bottle right now. <laughs> if not, what's wrong? You're not playing it right. Uh, audibletrial.com forward slash good bad geeky. A 30-day trial, but you do get a book from it, and uh, we sometimes gloss over this, but in this case in particular, it's actually pretty cool. You can, and in most cases, Steve Martin probably reads the book. I'm going to make a guess. Um, and uh, as you'll hear, you, it's probably a decent book to check out, you, but you'll get to that more in a second. Um, and last but not least, did you know that you are living your life wrong, Kyle? What? I didn't know that either, but you are. Take it from Nikki Smith, though, a woman... You should probably never take advice from. I had I messed up my copy. That was almost, but I didn't mess up though officially. No. But she's telling you to do it anyway. Nikki presents a weekly advice series on our YouTube channel called "Nikki Tells You How to Live Your Life," in which she will hilariously cover a lot of topics, like with much vulgarity. It's all been done anyway. So head over to iabdpresents.com and check out, check them out. Oh. So close. Mm-hmm. And please support all our programming at patreon.com forward slash IABD. So I think I had, what, four good episodes, if not kind of, I mean, I didn't really, but I kind of fucked it up. It was a good streak. It was a good streak, but now <laughs> it's been broken. So we're going to talk about Shop Girl, if you didn't get that already. Shop Girl by Steve Martin. Yeah. And uh, we talked, I felt like it was on the air. Or did we did we talk about it on the air? I felt like during Gar- not Guardians, it was Beauty and the Beast. Or uh, was no, it we after? First, we first talked about this after the Beauty and the Beast. After. We had stopped recording, and I think we just got on a Steve Martin tangent. And, uh, I don't even remember had, how. Yeah. You brought up these books, and I had said that I had never read them. And then I ended up going to a bookstore closeout and got both of these, uh, <sighs> both of his novellas. So. And it all went downhill from there. It all did. And yeah, and so if you go to our website, if you're or if you're already on our website, thank you. But if you if not, gbgpodcast.com, you can see a picture of the original book art. I'm going to take a picture of this. And this is actually I've actually borrowed Kyle's book because mm-hmm. mine's in storage or I don't know where it's at. Um, or I'm a horrible human being and I do not own it, which I should. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, what was I also going to say? So Steve Martin, Shop Girl, a novella. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. If you go to audibletrial.com, you can have it be your free book. Yeah. And you can listen to it and then listen to this episode. I, I think it's quick to say there are a lot of spoilers. Um, yes, we discussed this book quite in depth. In depth. I mean, we read passages. From matter of fact, we actually read the end. Yeah. So. Um, but 
again, and you'll find out kind of why it's rather easy to do that. Because mm-hmm. um, when you think even a novella, it's you know it's very full text and whatever. You will see why as we start reading passages from it. And hopefully, though, we do entice you to read the book. Or if you halfway get through of it and you really start to sound like you might enjoy this, please, I, I, you should never tell someone to do this, But even if, if it's a joke. But stop, watch, stop listening to us now. Stop yeah. watching us now. Come back later. And come back. But seriously, come back later. Um, and then if you have thoughts that differ from ours, uh, it, then let us know at goodbaggeeky at gmail.com or Twitter us at goodbaggeeky or... God forbid Instagram. If I don't know why people would talk to me through Instagram this way for that, but I gladly accept it. The kids, um, the kids, the kids today. <laughs> um, uh, you can write me at, at Instagram, uh, 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 good bag geeky as well. Though you might need to hit follow for Laven, and I have to follow you back <laughs> um, because it's a private account. Um, I don't know why. I just kind of feel like that's my it's my guard. It's like no, you may you can follow me, but I will. Yeah, I have to approve you first, right? Or or maybe it starts out private and then you or I don't know. It's <laughs> um, or maybe I did turn it. I I just felt like it's. <laughs> I don't know it today on you don't know me. Nick doesn't know himself uh, or anything that he does. I don't even know why this fucking battery's on the table. Well, there's a battery on the table. <laughs> I have no idea why it's there. Why is the receipt there? Did I buy something? Um, before we officially start, too, I, I think it's really important to give a big shout out to Amanda Iman and her uh, podcast, AmandaAgogo.com, um, where you can find her podcast, Culture Pop Agogo, and Amanda's picture show, Agogo. She was originally supposed to be on tonight's episode and uh, did not feel well. And uh, so, Amanda, we hope you feel better. Sorry you missed out on the conversation we're about to have. But. But yeah, Shop Girl Steve Martin, it's really fun, and it's a great conversation, and uh, we hope that you get the book and read it, and then listen to it, and if you have thoughts, again, good, bad, geeky, any of the social medias, except for Tumblr, I don't have that yet, and um, also, let's plug something else, too, we talked about it a little bit, but let's officially plug it again, Kyle Jepsen is in the series Red Roo, yes. which you can go to youtube.com forward slash Red Roo series. You can follow them all on social media, which kind of like us, Red Roo series. Yeah. Uh, social medias, um, well, social media. It's we all, got, we all. got the Facebooks. Twitter. We, we got, got the Twitters. We got the Instagram. We got the Tumblers. Even. You got the Tumblers, see? The wow, yeah, big deal. You got the BGBG there. They don't have the Tumblr yet. <laughs> You're speaking to all the kids today. Oh, oh dear God. Um, but no, check it out. It is actually really good. Kyle's fantastic in it. Along with <laughs> everybody you. that showed up in um, GBG episode uh, 350, they are all fantastic. Yes. Um, so check that out. And then uh, here's this very spoiler-filled episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Geeky. Episode 352, Shop Girl by Steve Martin. Shop Girl. All right. So, uh, as you heard in the intro, mm, yes, <laughs> we are discussing uh, sh- the the book Shop Girl by Steve Martin. I'm holding Kyle's copy, which he let me borrow. Yes, because I don't know where the hell mine is. Um, actually, I don't think I had this because I couldn't get it in hardback. I'm a weird. I gotta have it in hardback usually. Oh yeah. yeah. I did not abuse your book. No. Because my usual want is I'm just. Is to flip it around uh-huh. and read it that way. That's why I don't like paperbacks. Well, see, I'm I'm kind of the same way. I don't like um, I don't like novels that get turned into movies and then use the movie poster as their cover. Like I will flat oh. out, I, I flat out refuse to buy a book if it's yeah. Uh, you have the original. Mm-hmm. I, I wish people actually. I posted this on my Instagram and I'll I'll repost it again for you know what. Take another picture yeah. and I will use that. Um, but it's and here's the thing. After reading the book, this does not remind me of Maribel, mm-hmm. who is the lead of our story. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, when you see the picture, be like, "Oh, yeah, you're right." It looks and again. I don't think Steve Martin had anything to fuck do with that. Oh yeah, probably. I, not. I mean, he probably just goes out of the three pictures here. Which one do you think will sell more books? Now we will probably cut your demand, and supply and demand down if you don't choose these two over here. <laughs> um, and he's just like, "I know how business works. Yeah, whatever yeah, one you want." Mm-hmm. Yeah, sex sells. Um, yeah. This surprisingly also is too a very sexual book. Yeah. And you and I 
I've not read his other books and before this one, or, or no, I've not. I still have it. I've read books he's written after this one, mm-hmm. and they all seem to have the same kind of mindset. Like it's very well written, very whatever. Um, almost in some ways, very lots way smarter than me. <laughs> um, by reading sentences together, I I have a general idea of what he's trying to say. But mm-hmm. you know what? I don't have time to look up what words mean in today's <laughs> society. So I have a general idea of what he's trying. But but again, I think that's or it's it's like Futurama. You're doing a math joke right now. I don't know what it means, but I know it's funny. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. So you get you get the gist. And I feel the same way here, but it's all about little observations and or stuff about relationships. Mm-hmm. That's really what this comes down to is it's and it's also really weirdly written. And mm-hmm. I think we talked about this last well, not weird, it's just that when you read a novella it's, it's or different. a book, this almost reads like a synopsis or a treatment for the movie. Mm-hmm. Like there like there's no full dialogue scenes like this would be a 400 page book of a relationship Mm -hmm. something by uh emily something or other the girl who does like a little something something borrowed something blue emily gordon no that's 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 the girl from big sick what am i thinking of she has a series of books like they did a movie didn't do well oh okay so like a romance novelist romance novelist kind of thing but um, of course, way smarter. Um, no offense to her. I mean, I've read a little bit of that book, and it's it's very... Well, I know, like, when you and I first started talking about these, because I, I think we started chatting about these, this and uh, The Pleasure of My Own Company... Yes. ...after the Beauty and the Beast podcast. Yes, yes, and yes. And I remember, like, you talked about how it's kind of weirdly written and very, like, segmented, almost. Yes. But then I know that you and I kind of discussed it, like, offhandedly a few weeks ago, and I actually see it more as kind of... It reads more like a memory because, oh, you know, I had never put any, that together. Any kind of relationship that I think a person has, like, you know, there are going to be finer details that are going to fade over time. And then you're left with just more of a an impression of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she kind of it talks about sort of the sequence of events like, you know, they continued to go on dates and then they, you know, continued. To, he, yeah. he would buy her clothing and whatnot. And. But I, I get what you mean that it is. It is a very kind of um, it, it jumps a lot and very quickly. Right. Like, but I think it gets to more of the kind of important, like you know, the it gets to the important moments a lot quicker than like way. an actual memory. Now mm-hmm. that you said that, I've never ever ever thought of it like that at all. Well, because again, I mean, this was the first time I ever read something kind of like this, mm-hmm. like. Not content wise, I've read. I have not read a lot, but I mean, you read Cosmopolitan and you read the same stuff mm-hmm. technically, or or that's a bad example, but you get the point. Um, this is just like, and also with Steve Martin, you're thinking it's going to be like laugh out loud funny, and there's a few moments that are kind of funny, but mm-hmm. it's also kind of tragic in how kinda, it's presented. I love this book though because it's very much, it's such a good snapshot of loneliness. Yes. In a way. Yes. And especially for all the characters that are featured in it. You know, for all three of, we'll say, the main characters. It kind of... Yeah. Has a, it, it has a really wonderful way of sort of, like, honing in on what loneliness is and what it feels like. And um, I actually... my the, se- the sequence of events, like, I'm usually, you know, a big-ass snob about this kind of stuff. And I try to read the book before I see the movie. But in this case, I saw the movie for before the, I ever read, read the, the book. book. And um, when the movie came out, like I was like, oh, it's it's good, it's a good movie. And you know, mm-hmm. at that time, I was like a you know happy go lucky. <sighs> God, when did this come out? Two thousand five. I was like nineteen. Yeah, and the movie came out, I think, in two thousand nine. Two thousand nine. Okay. I don't so quote na- me on that. So I was I was definitely in college and still like in my early twenties. <clears throat> and you know, since that time, I think i the book really affected me a lot more especially given like recent events you know Mm -hmm. just in the past like few years like i've had kind of uh personally i've had issues with you know depression anxiety that i've never really tackled yeah tackled or or dealt with before like you know we always have some people always have like bad days but it's definitely kind of become more of an ever-present companion right more so lately and i feel like reading this really kind of i feel like it's the first like written account of you know of depression specifically that i think really really resonated with me in a way that not many other things have lately i 
I I remember when I read it, it, it did kind of like wow, like okay, and sorry, as I'm um, because I'm trying, to, I'm thinking of two things at once. So mm-hmm. I'm way wrong. This came out in 2000. Mm-hmm. The movie came out in 2005. Yeah, you are okay. dead fucking so I was on. 19 you, when you, that movie came out. So of course at the time I'm like, oh she's sad. Um, that sucks. She's on medication. Da da da. Well. Okay, so <laughs> from the guy's perspective, I related. It's a weird thing. I in in relation to this, they built Jeremy's character way better in the movie. I felt like yeah, thoughts he, on Schwartzman aside, which you yeah. do not care for Schwartzman, <laughs> we'll which, get to that later. which we'll get to that later. <laughs> and here's the thing: we're not going to talk about the movie honestly too much because we didn't really re- watch that in the last month. Mm-hmm. Um, we've just read the book, but memory wise, like I feel like Schwartzman character, like they showed him on the road and it showed him. Yeah, they definitely fleshed out his journey a little bit more right. than they did in the book. The book that I think what they dedicate like maybe a page or two to you know, him. and it's at the end mm-hmm. when, when he when shows he re- back up, when he reappears. Right? Yeah, they kind of they do intersplice it in the actual movie a bit better I think so it, it kind of gives a more linear story right so you can see it sort of happening side by side with Mirabelle yes but um, yeah no I think that it's it, he's very much like he's he's kind of a bookend character almost yes because he comes in at the, at the top she thinks of him very, once or twice mm-hmm. in the middle yeah but it's almost in passing of well this is what he did not get right yeah and this is why I'm happy with Ray mm-hmm. oh so I guess we should talk about the three characters we've kind of said maybe, names maybe we the don't synopsis a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, it's a shop girl by Steve Martin. So actually, we'll read a little bit of the book flaps because the flappies have all the info. Not all of them, but uh, Mirabelle is the shop girl of the title, a young woman, beautiful in a wallflowerish kind of way, who works behind the glove counter at Neiman Marcus, selling things that nobody buys anymore. Mirabelle captures the attention of Ray Porter, a wealthy businessman almost twice her age. As they tentatively embark on a relationship, they struggle to decipher the language of love with consequences that are both comic and heartbreaking. True. Mm-hmm. Fill with the okay. Then we get into the. You know what? Let's just read the, the deprecation and, and uh, of Steve Martin. Fill with the kind of witty, discerning observations that have brought Steve Martin critical success. Shop Girl is a work of disarming tenderness. <laughs> I, I I very much do agree with that. Um, but so so yeah. But and we added this. Talk about third character. So there's Jeremy. And you don't even get his name until the very end. You don't even get Mirabelle's name, last name, until the middle of the book, I feel, if I yeah, remember correctly. Yeah, when she goes home. And Ray Porter, though, you get right away. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he's definitely one of those characters. Like, you know, there are certain people um, in your life that you always seem to identify them by their full name and never just by one or the other. And if you remember their middle name, too, then they're probably an assassin. <laughs> if I've learned anything from Conspiracy Theory, yeah. the movie. But, 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 yeah, you know, there are people, like, so I think... It's very estab- it's established early on, early on that Ray Porter will always be Ray Porter, and they always refer to him as such, even you know in that's yeah yeah even like, in the casual sense yeah or oh and there is also a side character which they I feel like well it's hard to do her in the movie properly which is Lisa the counter girl yeah the kind of enemy slash yes not so nemesis but yeah she's almost a booking character in the movie but mm-hmm. in the book she's it she's kind of constantly there mm-hmm. and. I remember reading it, I was like, she's going to totally, she, she hates, well, again, which, that's interesting, too. He kind of gives her a full character arc, even though, again, it's almost in synopsis form, of Lisa, her whole life is built around the sa- fact that she can get whatever she wants from men with her mm-hmm. with sex. Mm-hmm. Well, Mirabelle's not that at all. Mm-hmm. Mir- yeah, And so, to the point where you get the sense that Lisa has lost her ability to actually connect with other human beings... Or, or I mean, but she's also kind of okay with that, but she's not. She's not though, because she does see that connection. Yes, you know between and, between Mirabelle and Ray Porter, and, and then she she her. and it, yeah, it aggravates her, and she craves it, and so she tries to steal it because she thinks that that can easily be you know recreated with her mm-hmm. in Mirabelle's place, which is really interesting. Yes, but yeah, oh man, it, this, this it, book was really kind of cool, just given that it's how many pages is it? Like a uh, hundred and twenty. Well, actually, here, hold on. We, I mean, we're, we, I keep flipping through the books. So you probably hear me flip. It's one hundred and thirty. Yeah. I thought it was one hundred twenty. It's one hundred thirty. So it's you know, it's a quick read, and it was actually one of those books that I had to take the time, and I really tried to savor it and not read it all in one go. Because it's pretty easy to do. Sure it looks like you did too. <laughs> I I read it all in one go mm-hmm. the second but you, time. But you've also read it before. That's that's true. So I, that's I, true. I've never read it before, and more lately, I've become not a great reader. I just I used to like read voraciously all mm-hmm. the time, and now I don't really read at all, which is kind of sad. But Aww. when it comes down to it, I just don't really have the time because I'm busy. 
And so it was nice to kind of sit down and like really get engrossed kind of in a world of yes. of his creation. And I just I really loved, you know, just kind of the setup of talking about her life at the very beginning. So, you know, they talk about her and, you know, she has a very kind of monotonous monotonous and sort of mundane life even with her passion you know she'll that's true yeah she'll go to work and she'll go home and she goes to an art thing with her like flippant friends that are kind of mentioned in passing and passing a kid and something or, the, Loki yeah, yeah. or something Loki yeah Loki <laughs> yeah. and Ditsy I caught it's not Loki's correct mm-hmm. but I, I don't remember the name of the other one it starts with a D though yeah and you know she goes to art openings and wants to become an artist and in LA which is a, a bit strange to me but there you go yeah and then she <laughs> <laughs> she ends up with her you know her two cats that never one never really comes out and like her her life just seems very kind of set in stone yes and then and then I oh you'll have to, I forget you'll have to remind me how does she meet Jeremy at the laundry mat right yes and that's the thing is that it's almost a passing reference of the laundromat mm-hmm. And they actually talk about it more at the end of the book to the point where I had to actually stop and go back and read that whole thing again because mm-hmm. I was just like, I really don't remember the laundromat part of it. Like it's almost a, a very, it's a, almost a minute detail mm-hmm. when they when he when he writes it like well, when yeah. they meet passing it's, memory. It's a passing like, right. Oh yeah, we did it for a while. We met at like a laundromat kind of thing, and you know it kind of. I, it shows those kind of awkward like relationships where you think that you should be trying, but maybe you should quit kind of earlier on yeah but it also sets them up for later on in the story when they kind of you know reconnect later on after he's found himself right which yeah. and, and even then he's not but he knows he knows what's wrong or he doesn't he doesn't know what's wrong he just knows that there's something wrong and he has to fix it which mm-hmm. um i remember you posted on facebook uh i'll you know well or we're, i feel like we're, we're all over the place yeah we are it's um <laughs> because i actually want to read that's one of the things i want to read because i f- fucking love that that excerpt yeah. yes um there's so, a few yeah, so at the beginning she yeah so she works at neiman Marcus. yes thank you she <laughs> dates this guy jeremy for a while but it goes pretty disastrously and it's because she's lonely it's mm-hmm. not she doesn't like that's the thing she doesn't like jeremy not really mm-hmm. or there are moments there are glimpses of someone that she could like yeah and you know i really kind of I like the her her sort of like thought process toward the beginning of the book of like you know she she decides that she wants to have sex with someone that night only so there's a possibility that someone will hold her after you know kind of craving that human emotion and connection right that maybe that you know a lot of people in her situation maybe don't have so then you know her and Jeremy sort of fizzle out after a while it seems and all of a sudden, out of the blue, this older man, yeah, Ray Porter. Which, which, and this is actually uh, just to throw out there. Uh, okay, so if this gets boring, I apologize. I don't intend it to be, but this is just what. This is actually the first time that she meets Ray mm-hmm. um, today. As she stares hypnotically at these tribal women, one clear thought emerges to Mirabelle: How different this place is from Vermont. Then, out of the idleness that uh, permeates every day at work, she sifts her way from one foot to the other. She scratches her elbow, she curls her toes, then angles her leg to give her calf half a stretch. She flicks a paperclip several inches across the glass of the countertop. She runs her tongue along the back of her teeth. Footsteps approach her. Her automatic response is to strain up and look like she is ever ready for the Nealman sales team, for the sound of footsteps could mean a supervisor as likely a customer. One she sees, though, is a rare sight on the fourth floor glove department. It is a gentleman looking for a pair of ladies' dress gloves. He wants them wrapped, and could they do that? Mirabel nods in her professional way, and then the man, sharply dressed in a dark blue suit, asks her opinion on which is the finest pair. Being a sharp dresser herself, she actually does have an opinion on the merchandise she offers, and she gives him the lowdown of smart glove purchasing. <laughs> there is some conversation about what and who they are for. The man gives her some embarrassed, vague answers, often the case when men shop for women. And in response, she suggests that the silver satin doors are the best Dior. Dior's. Oh, damn it. So close. Uh, her purchases. He purchases the gloves with a credit card, smiles at her, and leaves. Mirabel watches him walk away. Her eyes go to his shoes, which she understands and knows something about. And her inner checklist gives him full marks in all categories. Mirabel catches herself in the countertop mirror and realizes that she has blushed. Oh, oh yes. Oh and that's actually... And then it just... It 
completely changes gears again, mm-hmm. talks about ordering Chinese food. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, it doesn't really come back to him until she no. gets... And so right. he does something a little creepy, would you call it? Because I feel like a girl her age would definitely, like, if, if I were in her situation, I think I would misconstrue it as almost romantic. But basically what he does is he gets her address from the department store and ends up sending her the gloves in the mail. Yes. Saying that he wants to take her to dinner instead of asking her face to face. Yes. <laughs> Um, I don't look. I'm not a good gauge for stuff like that. <laughs> so I'm going to say yes, mm-hmm. and no, I can. I don't know. I, I I'm really bad at gauging. To me, I would think that I think that's like a boss move. Mm-hmm. I would never. I feel oh no! It would, don't get me wrong. It's it's a good move. But like when you kind of dissect it and look at the sort of like smaller things of like how it got to that point, you're kind of like. Ooh, Let's damn. be clear, though. Realistically. It would be the creepy side. Mm-hmm. If you can come in, and even in the movie, Steve Martin looks boss when he does it. Yeah. But again, he wrote and he could... Sh- he, yeah. yeah, yeah, But I mean, like, but, at the end of the day, like because because Ray Porter's a rich guy, he can get away with that kind of stuff. That's true. Uh, which, as we will learn, doesn't mean you really get away with it. Mm. Um, but he's... He's... I mean, we're skipping ahead again a little bit, but just to talk about Ray, he's just as broken as Mirabelle, but in a completely different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so she meets Ray Porter. She also meets Jeremy. And it, so it was about her day a little bit more until it finally becomes something where she's just like, I want a connection with another human being. And really, she doesn't even want the connection. She just wants to be held. Mm-hmm. And so, and I really love his description of, and it's very much true, because anyone who, I mean, this is from a, 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 a heterosexual male's point of view, but okay. when you have sex with another woman, you have been blessed with her want to have sex with you, <laughs> or have sex in general. And I'm sorry, it doesn't matter, I, in, in, especially if you're single, she, you know what I mean? If things have worked out just right, that is how she has said, A-OK, where this is happening, because I don't know why, for a number of reasons that you'll never really understand. <laughs> Um, unless you guys continue to see each other, then whatever. Uh, and that's me really dumbing down a relationship. Uh, but uh, there is a thing here, I think, that about Jeremy, which I really love. Uh, page 22. Um, where Where is it at? Page 22. It's always been a sign of time redemption. By the way, it's Loki and Del Rey. Del Rey. Are the friends. Right. Wow. Jeez, Nick. Uh where is okay um Mirabel wakes to a crisp LA day with an ice blue chill in the air the view from her apartment is of both mountains and sea but she can see it only by peering around her front door she feeds the cats drinks her potion and puts on her best underwear although it is unlikely anyone will see it today unless someone bursts in on her in the changing room she had a nice day on Sunday because her friends Loki and Del Rey finally called back and invented her, invited her to, to brunch at one of the outdoor cafes on Western they gossiped and talked about the men in their lives, about who is gay and who isn't, about who is coked head and uh, coked out and who's promiscuous, and Mirabel regaled them, regaled them with the Jeremy story. Loki and Del Rey were obviously named by parents uh, who thought they would never not be infants, told similar stories, and the three of them cried with laughter. This uh, buoyed Mirabel, and it made her feel normal, like one of the girls. But when she went home that night, she wondered if she betrayed Jeremy just a little, as something in her believed that he would not have told her told about their exploits over lunch with the guys this little thought was a tiny foundation for jeremy's tiny redemption and it made part of her like him if only just a little bit (laughs) and and that is very much true when you're in a relationship when you're not in a relationship if you and some people they just they just tell everybody or or you know but even then it's just like there's always a little bar it's like am i betraying them a little bit or an art Mm -hmm. but we never really think of it like that but i was like that's such an interesting observation Mm -hmm. that i would it's so weird. I, I just really like that little... Also a little bit naive on her part, I, I think, but uh, I'm also true. kind of a pessimist. <laughs> well, yeah. I, was it, I'm, a real, I'm, I'm a pessimistic optimist, or I, an optimistic I, pessimist. I like to say that I'm a closet optimist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the new B&L album, mm-hmm. it, the songs are... Uh, uh, the lyrics, though, there's one he's like, the, half, the, the, uh, the glass is half full, but I drank it. So you can have the rest, <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was very like, gee, hey, I was like, oh, that's an interesting way to say it. But yeah, I, I just there, the book is full of little things like that, mm-hmm. where you know it, about it, just the whole totality of relationships, which I really love. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, 
she obviously hangs out with Del Rey. I'm going to keep saying Del Rey because I'm so proud I found the name <laughs> this time. Uh, and Loki. And she goes about her day. And then Ray Porter comes back into her life and seduces... Well, he takes her out to dinner. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I have something for that, too. I just have a lot of stuff just written down. Um, oh, okay. This is a weird note. She goes into his garage and something about gray Mercedes. Mm-hmm. And he has a double g- car garage, and, and actually, it's a gray Mercedes with another gray Mercedes. And the logic being, Ray Porter, the logic is he cannot stand taking the effort and time to take his uh, supplies out of one car and p- taking them out, putting them back out, or mm-hmm. whatever. And they so, talk about that with his houses too. Yeah, he has he has a specific set of clothes for Los Angeles and a specific set for Seattle. And I mean, when you think about it, and this is kind of just occurring to me now, so I could be completely full of crap, but in a way, I think that Jeremy and Ray are kind of the same person, just at different points in their life. life. And then also, Ray has money, which is something Jeremy does not have at the beginning Beginning of of the book. book. At the beginning of the book, yes. Because, I mean, you think about it, like, Ray, and they, you know, when they go into, like, kind of Ray's little, like, vignettes on his own, that, you know, it's very obvious, like, from the beginning, even though he's seeing Mirabelle, he's seeing other women. Yes. Um, because he's very, I think, desperate to find the great love of his life, no matter what it takes. So, yes. you know, they, they show him constantly, like, seeing other people and then, you know, kind of disappointing Mirabelle throughout about, you know, talking about how he yeah. is just so happy that they can have this relationship where they're together, but they're not serious and they can feel free to go about their... So... Do you have it? I have... One of the conversations, because it happens officially in conversation twice. Mm-hmm. Other times it's kind of mentioned in passing. And, you, and again, I feel like it's that's more Mirabelle's version of the memory, which is it almost sounds condescending in a way when he brings it up. But they don't say the conversation. This one they do. Um, and also just to uh, get you... Ray, because this is more from Ray Porter's perspective a little bit too. Again, Mr. Ray Porter takes Mirabelle to La Ronde. They sit at the same booth and have the same wine, and everything is done to replicate their first dinner because Ray Porter wants to pick up exactly where they left off, not even with a design change in a fork handle to break the con- continuum. Mirabelle is not sparkling tonight because she works only in gears, and tonight she is in the wrong gear. Third gear is her scholarly, uh, pres- I can't say that word, witty self. Just know it's an awesome word, uh, and I understand what it means. I just can't. Second gear is her happy, giddy, childish self, and first gear is her complaining, helpless, unmotivated self. The night, though, she is somewhat in mid-shift between helpless and childish, but Ray doesn't care. Ray Porter doesn't care because tonight is the night, as far as he is concerned, the night where everything is going to come off her, and Ray feels compelled to have the conversation. It is appropriate tonight because of Ray Porter's fairness doctrine. Before the clothes come off, speeches must be made. (laughs) (laughs) See, that's really funny and also depressing. Mm -hmm. I think I should tell you a few things. I don't think I'm ready for a real relationship right now, he says. This is uh, not to Mirabelle, but to the air, as though he is just discovering a truth about himself and accidentally is speaking it out loud <laughs> which is so funny Mirabelle answers you had a rough time with your divorce understanding for Ray Porter that is good she absolutely knows that this will never be long term he goes on but I love seeing you and I want to keep seeing you I do too says Mirabelle Mirabelle believes he has told her that she is bordering on falling in love with her and Ray believes she understands that he isn't going to be anybody's girl f- boyfriend <sighs> I'm traveling too much right now, he says. In this sentence, he serves notice that he would like to come into town, sleep with her, and leave. Mirabelle believes that he is expressing frustration at having to leave town and that he is trying to cut down on traveling. So what I'm saying is that we should be allowed to keep our options open, if that's okay with you. At this point, Ray Porter believes that he has told her that in spite of what could be about to happen tonight, they are still going to see other people. Mirabelle believes that after he cuts down on his traveling, they will see if they should get married or just go steady. So now they have had a, the conversation. What neither of them understands is that these conversations are meaningless. They are meaningless to the sayer and they are meaningless to the hearer. The sayer believes they are heard. The hearer believes that they never were said in the first place. Men, women, dogs, and cats, these words are never heard. They chat through dinner and then Ray asks her if she would like to come to his house and she says yes. And then the next, would you call that a chapter really? The divider for the next is like sexual intercourse. Yeah, so interlude. <laughs> interlude. Um, so that's where they get it freaky. Um, and I mean, it's that. Yeah, that part <laughs> in particular like broke my fucking heart. Yeah. Because 
it just and it's so per- it's such a perfect kind of representation of all those conversations that happen on both all sides the time, on both ends yeah. yeah you know people thinking that they're clearly communicating and they're not and that's the number one most important thing in a relationship is communication but yes even when we think that we're utilizing it in a fully like real in a you know fully formed way like we're not we're all just like these freaking you know infants running into walls and caves and we can't see and, and can I be very clear I have been completely as a guy on the Mirabelle end of that. Mm-hmm. And that sucks. And, I've, and so it's, know, I've been on the Ray and the Mirabelle end of that. Right. No, that's what I'm saying. I have not, I wish I was, uh, I wish I was more on the Ray side. <laughs> uh, not really. That's kind of depressing. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like that's the heart of the whole book is mm-hmm. just that one little, that, that page and a half. Yeah. Um, and just the study of that, of how it just kind of, and, and he so precisely explains it just by even just by stating the simple fact of what they both are getting out of the co- the conversation of words that are stated on the page. So it's not even their interpretation of the words. Yes, it's, you know, it's what he is saying, what he thinks that he is implying, and then how she is taking it. Right, and it's such a like kind of just mm, just. Mwah. I know, right? I get so. And it, what's sad is I felt like I had more notes than that, and so but. And I swear to God we did because uh, the page that you and I talked about, I thought I marked it up. But, um, I can probably find it. Yeah, uh, it's, it's towards the... Actually, I, I just pulled it up. Boom. Um, so... Well, so before we get to yeah, that... No, so. Yeah, of course, of so, course. I'm yeah, leave so, they right start, there. so they start kind of embarking on this relationship. And really, when you kind of look at it, I think that he does kind of start to realize that he cares for her more than he initially... Well, I don't think he understands thought. how to. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know... She goes through um, a lapse with her medication, yes. which, you know, where she kind of goes into this, would you call it a fugue state? Not, that's not the right word. Um, she goes into, you know, this kind of listless sort of. Right. And it and it kind of comes down into, um, which talks about her father's depression a little bit, too, mm-hmm. and how it impacts her. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't really go into that as well, I think, in the movie, but where it's, it's about Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Ironically, and they have the Vietnam thing right now, which I'm kind of watching, too. So it's almost just like a. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, understandably, this is traumatic for the dad, but um, yeah, and it's and her parents are in Vermont, and they don't really treat her like she's a woman. They treat her like a little child. Absolutely. Even when she goes home, and it's you know it's obvious that she is a woman, and she's going to be meeting b- meeting men and having sex out in L.A. But they kind of almost yes. block this out. In yeah. a way, and they do, you know, and then she talks about, I think it's a really good indicator that, like, her room is kind of left untouched, and it still has this sort of childlike quality to it when she goes back into it. But she also, you know, reinforces that by talking about how safe she feels yes. in her, like, room back home. Because mm-hmm. I think the way, that the, the, way, the way that the plot goes, you know, she goes into, a, she goes into like, a medication like kind of fall out where her meds aren't doing what they need to be doing for her anymore. Right. She goes into this kind of like listless, like catatonic state. And yeah. then Ray sort of comes to her rescue and just tries to throw money at the situation. To right. Make her and, and, and again, the whole time too, he's thinking, I'm going to get laid tonight. And he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't get like what's going on. And from I don't think there, he cares really either. Not really. It's well, all I about think, what he I wants. I think he's very confused by it. And yeah. Just, and has this sort of like non understanding about it that, he almost wants to start to figure it out, so he, in the end, can get laid. But when you yeah. when you look at it, you know, because he starts, I think he does start to kind of more deeply care about her, especially like toward the middle and end of the book. Yes. you know, he'll do the things like he starts buying her clothing and a new vehicle, and he'll he pays off her student loan debt too. I from think art so. School. Yeah, yeah. And if it starts off almost too as almost a, I am so sorry, I broke your heart, even though I don't understand how I did it, mm-hmm. and then. Because that's the thing. The book ends. And oh yeah, because he does. He breaks her heart by sleeping with someone and just telling them and, and tells her. Now it's important to know too. That's very. That's um, it, It's very cleverly in retrospect foreshadowed because at the beginning of the book when we are following Ray, I didn't even talk about this. We didn't talk about this. Is that they do this scene where Ray has a woman in his hometown of Seattle? Yep. And she apparently is. A, a feels like we don't really go into it further than that. Which is she seems to be okay with it, but she's just like you know what. Maybe just don't tell me when you do the things that you do. Mm-hmm. I think she's definitely that character is kind of established as a little more distant and removed from the situation, right? Because she's very much like, "Why are you calling me?" And she's like, "Oh, you know, just she's like shaving my legs," or she'll, she seems very much like it's more kind of on a friends with benefits term that right. she is kind of in line with as opposed to Mirabelle. Yes, exactly. And so at the end, though, 
I, I, it, I feel like it starts off where, I mean, he destroys Maribel. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the whole time Jeremy's not even really mentioned. That's because for people who are on the Jeremy train, he's not really there yet. He's not. He's not there. Actually, there's one scene I think in the um, before we get. I think right after the sexual intercourse, very close after that, where you see him talking to his boss, and he's just like, "I'll go on the road and I'll do everything for free, except mm-hmm. for if I succeed at this, I get whatever. I get a lot of money out of it. Yes, commission. And then uh, that's it." Yeah, and then he's, yeah, almost like never to be heard from again. Again. And uh, Mirabel goes through her thing. She goes to Vermont. Um, and her, then. And her and Ray kind of have a reconciliation in New York, right? Yes. And, and part of it, though, is that, or at least, and this is my interpretation of this, but. Because it's just like she gets a call from Ray or she calls her. I don't remember that part, but. Uh, or no, Ray calls her and is like, please come to New York. Mm hmm. And I think she's starting to... Because I think that's when she found the pictures of her dad. Yeah. And she just... I'm not... Maybe things are worse here than it may seem to be. So she gets out of there. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a reconciliation, but it's 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 not. Like the booking that says, this is not the beginning of the end yet. Mm-hmm. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. Because you do want them, you want them to somehow work it out. I feel, but even though they're not well for each other, mm-hmm. you, well, I guess that I don't know. It's a weird thing when I watch a movie or a book or read a book. I, you do start to ship people a little bit, mm-hmm. and if these are the two leads of the characters, you want them to find happiness, and you hope yeah. it can be with each other. But if not, I love it if they don't either too, because they learn together, and they it does, and they do learn. And do you, my question is, do you think that we're were it less of a May December romance, which you know is the the trope of like the younger woman with the older mm. man, if it were less that and they were a little closer in age, do you think it would have gone differently? No, and maybe. <laughs> so this is really bad. Um, and this is my jumping off point for this. Is right as you were saying that, my first thought is there is a wonderful movie with Steve Martin in it. Um, it's just as cheesy as all the rom coms out there, but I think it's uh, it's Steve Martin, Alec Baldwin, and Meryl Streep. I can't remember the name. I think it's it takes two. It's or, where it's her ex husband is Alec Baldwin, and or is it something's got to give or, or uh, something's got to give with is, is Jack Nicholson that's and Diane Jack Keaton. Nicholson. Which that is also a fantastic movie, that by is the way. A good one. Um, but I remember no, but I, I've seen that one. And I, yeah, yeah and he actually good. plays it. Steve because usually Steve Martin plays like even in Shop Girl. No, no Shop Girl. He didn't do that in Shop Girl either. I feel like that was a serious. Uh, he kind of did the same thing. Like he played it straight, mm-hmm. um, and but he plays it straight in that movie too. Like the jokes are more between Alec Baldwin and Meryl Streep, where like, hey, we're like two wild, crazy kids. You know, remember before I got you knocked up and we got pre- and we have like a f- gigantic family. Mm-hmm. It feels good to be divorced and not have to commit to each other, but we're we are. Uh, it's really going to bother me. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it's all right. Alec Baldwin. Google break. Google break. Google 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 break. <laughs> Google. <laughs> Uh, trivia. I don't want the fucking trivia. Okay, so I'm using the IMDb app because usually it's good. It's being kind of shitty right now, <laughs> and I don't really love that. Um, like, I'm in the year 2014. It's, I feel like it's a little bit before, it's definitely before Rock Age. Um, it's complicated. That's right. 2009, a few years after. So it's a few years after Shop Girl, but I feel like Martin plays, he actually plays an architect in it. Mm-hmm. who is just, he is looking for a relationship, a serious one. And Meryl Streep, I don't think, she's kind of in the place that Ray is where she doesn't know what to do. And this is me dumbing it down from memory. But, like, he he kind of is in Maribel's situation almost, which he's like, I'm divorced, but I now know what I want. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready, I'm ready. to, I'm and, ready to uh, settle down and get married and, like, just... Yeah. Be in the relationship. I kind of feel that similar vibe, and maybe that's why he did it. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. But, um, but, but, so it's hard to say if, in terms of what the question you asked, which is what it matters, because I watch that and I completely, matter of fact, I look as more Steve Martin as more the main character, or maybe that's because I relate to him more in that, mm-hmm. because I was like, that kind of sucks. Like, is it funny with Alec Baldwin and Meryl Streep? Yeah. Um, and Meryl Streep wants something serious too, but I don't think she knows about it yet because it's complicated. Hey. Ah. No, but I mean, it's one of those. And that, that, I do remember that movie. That's kind of one of those movies that you watch and you're like, you know, they did that because they they just wanted to have some fun for a few months, right? And that, it very clearly Who comes across that? in the movie. Was that? Uh, mm-hmm. I'm thinking it's the uh, oh Nancy Myers. 
she, she does decent yeah. versions of movies like that. Followed by uh, she passed away a few years ago. She wrote yeah. When Harry Met Sally. I can't think of her name. Um, Nora Ephron. Nora Ephron. I Actually, like Nora Ephron her, movies. Her her book is also on my um is it on my pile. Let me know how that is yeah. because I do. I've never read her books, mm-hmm. but I I. I love You've Got Mail, un- unashamedly. Oh, me yeah, too. It's fantastic. That is the movie of the fall. I, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, yeah, when Harry met... So, uh, here's the thing. I don't love Sleepless in Seattle. I get it. It's charming. Mm-hmm. But, like, I, I, I'd rather point to You've Got Mail <laughs> instead and be like, that's, to me, the better Ryan the Hanks. Two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, anyway, sorry. That was a weird tangent on... That's yeah, right. We're I'm talking about a romantic... That, w- that is only true. Makes sense we talk about romantic yeah. movies. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. But, yeah, like, so what happens? They go to New York and, like, the relationship still... They, they It seems to, like, kind of... Mm, words. It seems to draw <laughs> out <laughs> yeah. a long time, even though it probably should have ended, like, either before or back in New York. Because mm-hmm. then it goes into the whole... I think then it goes into the whole her, him, like, you know, buying her expensive things and a car and paying off college tuition and all these things. Yeah. And then they still in the end kind of end up like breaking up and it, and then Jeremy suddenly reappears in her life and is this like new kind of shining beacon to her because she's like oh he's wearing a suit and isn't well she doesn't recognize him at first because they're true. at an out ga- uh, art gallery yeah. in LA which uh-huh. Ray's taking her to and ironically enough this is where the Lisa the store, the other storefront girl yes. her part comes in major play which I think she's like probably one of the most overtly like comedic elements in the book yes just her talking about you know what she does and and in the movie I just remember I I'll, okay this is horrible because as a guy you guys are probably going ha, 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 of course you would I kind of want to see whoever they got that actress to do is I kind of wanted to see it portrayed in the movie and of course because it's PG-13 or even I think it's a light R they didn't do it which is she's like just in the nude shaving herself oh my god yeah on like on the toilet on like, the toilet shaving, shaving and it's that a was, very graphic description and, yeah. and, but it shows her like she's like matter of fact I even think they say she's a cougar on the prowl mm-hmm. she's going to take down her prey and her prey is Ray Porter because Mirabelle does not to, to I think at some point, she even says, to erase the Mirabelle mistake. Yes. Because it's completely warped her version of how the world works. Yes. And she and can't you know, handle it. They, yeah, and, they, and he goes into this very, like... It's like not, not, not like Not, like, grossly graphic, but just, like, a very, like, literal depiction of what she is doing, like, which is... She's uh, shaving her pubic hair on the toilet, which, first of all, like, ew. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes. Oh, my... Like, it's... Th- and, I also I won't say the I won't say that word because I know Laura already did <laughs> on the last podcast. I you know I I cut it out, <laughs> but uh, her she was shaving her vagina. Yeah, but they talk about later when she oh. enters into the art gallery that she would be the only woman in there with a see you next Tuesday that smelled of lavender. That's okay. And no. that was one of my very like yes, mo- that was one of my moments reading this book. Where I was like, oh. Okay. Oh, I found it. I found it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this actually, this whole little subset is is Lisa's point of view. Mm-hmm. I'll just read the whole thing because it's not that long. Lisa got wind of Mirabelle's Prada visit. For Lisa, Prada is the end all, be all of courtship. Its exquisite clothes are not only expensive but identifiable. A Prada dress is a Prada dress, and it will always be a Prada dress, especially a new Prada dress. A new Prada dress means that the trip to the shop is recent, that fresh money has just been sent, and if Lisa were wearing a new Prada address, it would signify a big catch on her part. It would show that she had landed money, and that her man had spent enough time with her to have escorted her to Beverly Hills, and waited till she had tried on each and every, and then shoved a credit card through thoughtlessly across the counter, even without checking the price tag. Lisa comes face to face with the rumor one morning when she sees Mirabel arrive to work in a sparkling and flattering killer dress. To Lisa, Prada is as recognizable as her own mother, and seeing Mirabel draped in the perfect Prada shift provokes her in a deep, guttural growl. Lisa calls her friend at the store to get the full scoop, and yes, Ray Porter and an unknown miss did roll through. The only Lisa thing Lisa can think to do is when she hears her worst fears confirmed is trim and coif her pubic hair I, I'm t- like and i knew it was coming i just started to laugh this is a ritualistic act of readiness a war dance that is akin to a matador's mystical preparations for battle it is also done out of her belief that everything natural about her has to be tampered with for it to achieve its utmost beautiful state breast lip size hair skin collar lip collar fingertips and toenails all need adjustment 
Lisa sits on the toilet as she shaves, one leg propped up on the bathroom cabinet. She can dip the razor in the toilet when she needs to wet it while she shapes and combs the furry patch to perfection. Which is the worst. Oh, that's so disgusting to me. I mean, if... Uh, like, whatever. even if it's fresh, yeah, it's still just it's like, just, girl. Yeah. Uh, Lisa's determined to call Ray Porter away from Mar- from the Mirabelle mistake. All she has to know is where he is and what does he look like. She can easily glean this from the trusting Mirabelle, probably in one lunch, so she doesn't worry too much or make plans to com- convine, to convene. Connive? Connive. Hmm. Sorry. Jesus, take a lot of drinks there, people. <laughs> After the final dip of the razor in the toilet, ugh, it's so disgusting, and a gentle splash of water to the now perfectly shaped lawn. <laughs> Again, it's just this whole, Lisa stands up, stark naked, and looks at herself in the bathroom mirror. She is an hourglass with all the sand on top. She is white and pink, and her implants pull and stretch and widen the skin around them so her breasts glow. Her nipples are the color of bubblegum, and the silicon makes them resilient enough to chew like bubblegum. Oh. And now, between her legs, is the nicest little piece of property west of Texas. <laughs> that is just such a, such a great... It's wonderful, like the entire. And it's horrifying. It's, yeah, it's it, it, the entire like couple pages that that goes over. You're just like, uh, it's almost like watching a train wreck because you just can't look away. You just right. keep going. And so is it? I know as the guy of me, it's really horrible to want to kind of see them how they would do that, and they they don't really. I mm-hmm. think it's all done tastefully, mm-hmm. but I'm, I I just remember when I was like. I really want to see that more than anything because it's like that's a mess. Ma- because and, and also here's the other thing too in real. R- if a movie star does have fake things, they're not going to want to have it be pointed out. Mm-hmm. I mean, and in my opinion, at that point, you get a porn star who can actually act. But I digress. They didn't do that. They got the girl who played Sonya Blade from Mortal Kombat. Can't remember her name right now. But oh. she, and she's actually not a bad actress. Mm-hmm. But um, she played up the villain part really. And Billy Madison, or not Billy Madison. Uh, what's the golf one? Happy Gilmore. She was the. Oh. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no. Maybe it was Billy Madison. The love interest in Happy Gilmore was uh, Jewel, the mom from Modern Family, uh, the Dumpies. Oh God, you're right. Yeah, so you're thinking of. Uh, uh, I, I am thinking, you're thinking of, of Billy Madison. Yeah, I am thinking of Billy Madison. Uh, and she's a good. She's a. She's a good actress. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just. Um, anyway, that I just. Yeah, that whole exchange, and then it's kind of you know it kind of plays up the comedy of her mistaking Jeremy, which right for Ray. So they go to this LA event, and Mirabelle knows, or Mirabelle is on kind of honest with her. She doesn't go into this. She's like my my boyfriend or my friend Ray Porter is going to take me to this thing, and she's like okay. And when Mirabelle's outside the gallery, uh, she sees a guy in a business suit, and mm-hmm. she can't see who it is doesn't recognize him and she's like hello Maribel and it ends up being Jeremy mm-hmm. and this wonder and it's almost like a, and then she goes back into that description I read earlier about how she sized Ray up mm-hmm. she does the same thing almost again like I feel like I have good taste in clothes mm-hmm. I, I know the merchandise and I'm making a checklist on the shoes mm-hmm. and you're like oh okay and a part of me is like because <laughs> you want I like Jeremy too when I read the book so um yeah, and they talk, and then it's one of those things where it's almost like a polite, friendly banter, and then uh, Lisa starts hitting on Jeremy, thinking that it's Ray, and so he doesn't, you know, actually he even says, she doesn't know me, I don't I don't really care, you know, which is interesting, or he says something very like that, which is like, we have nothing to do with each other, yeah, it's, there's no they possession. Almost, they almost meet as almost like kind of old friends or acquaintances that haven't seen each other in a while. They, exactly. Yes. I mean, they never really. It was kind of. It was more of a, a start and stop to what little their relationship was. Yes. They never really, you know, embarked on anything past like a couple like st- a couple weird dates and like a, you know what it was like a couple one night stands or just a one night stand. Yeah. Oh, and and by the way, that whole scene is fantastic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because Jeremy doesn't understand Lisa's aggressiveness, but he doesn't need to, and neither does his recently elevated consciousness. There is no way the tranquil waters in which his brain floats so serenely can also calm two testicles of an unattached 27-year-old male. Let me say goodbye to Maribel. Lisa almost but not quite feels embarrassed. Okay, but I'll wait outside. At her apartment, which she has been cleared of roommates by prearrangement, Jeremy gets the works from Lisa. He has shown the illustrated Karma Sutra of Lisa Kramer, Cosmetic Girls First Class, with additional notes con- contributed by a dozen how-to-fuck books, two radio psychologists, the gossip of two highly sex girlfriends, articles in Cosmo, and an incredible instinct for arousing a man's superficial interest. 
he is slowly stripped down. I mean, it keeps in it. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, she. After, she, she brings her A game. <laughs> yes. Afterward, Lisa believes her that she just blasted the head off Ray Porter and is reinforced when she asks if she is better than Mirabelle. And Jeremy, who has no idea that he is not Ray Porter, has no choice but to nod yes. After a customary but brief period of forced cuddling, Jeremy rolls out of her apartment and Lisa's last words being, call me. And then, of course, it's the typical, the next morning, Lisa picks up the phone ringing. Hi, it's Jeremy. Who, says Lisa? Jeremy. Do I know you, says Lisa. Jeremy jokes, when do you really know someone, am I right? Getting no laugh, he continues, uh, Jeremy from last night. Lisa goes through the list of men she spoke to last night. None is named Jeremy, though sometimes men find her and call her because they think they've made eye contact with her when they really haven't, which that's funny. Refresh me, Lisa says. Jeremy is dumbfounded at the possibility that all his exploits, all his, uh, oh, what's that word? I know it, uh, uh, catapulting. Is that really what that is? Jesus, Nick. All his cat. This is really just an excursion to hear Nick read poorly. All his catapulting could be so quickly forgotten by morning. He continues, me, Jeremy, I was at your place last night. Uh, we did it. Something all wrong, Don's and Lisa. Oh, Ray. When Jeremy hears, oh, Ray, he presumes it's slang or pig Latin or some contemporary expression of elation that he has gotten by him somehow. So he says it back. Oh, Ray. God, you were great last night, offers Lisa. Oh, Ray, says Jeremy. <laughs> what? Says Lisa. Jeremy involved in a conversation he now 100% cannot follow. Finally, he says, do you know who I am? Sure, you're Ray Porter. Who? Says Jeremy. Ray Porter from last night. Who's Ray Porter? You are... Then she adds, aren't you? And that's the end of that little snippet. The beginning goes back to Maribel and, and Ray. Uh, yeah. yeah, and like Jesus Christ, it's kind of the perfect like comeuppance. It is, if it, you know. Yeah, um, and I mean the way they even handle that, like just in general, uh, is just really. I mean, fun- it's, it's so, pretty beautiful. It's yeah. pretty beautiful. Um, but because so then. I forget, like, how do Ray and Mirabelle end up kind of breaking it off? Because she eventually decides to move. Well, I think that she's still dating Jeremy, or kind of seeing Jeremy, and it's like a slowly, they just slowly... F- Fizzle? It, 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 it tampers off. Yeah, and then, no, she, she, moved, she moves to San Fran to... Yeah, Mirabelle's stay in San Francisco stretches into several seasons. The frequency of her calls to Ray Porter diminish. She has few flirtations, conversations, really, that never amount to much. But one night, she takes the walk up the stairs of her new flat and notices on the doormat a small, oblong, clumsily wrapped box with an overlarge Hallmark card taped onto it. Once inside the apartment, this is how things also come together. Mm-hmm. Um, she feeds the cats and then tapes the end of the wrapping and inside finds a plain white box and inside that a rather cute swatch watch. She opens the note and reads, I would like to have dinner with you, Jeremy. And quickly scribble down its usually tactic implications. My treat. Okay, then it goes into Jeremy a bit more. Um, sorry. And then it goes back. So yeah, they kind of start, you know, Jeremy, a fledgling yes. friendship that then turns into more of a relationship over time. Yes. Yeah. There's this that that excerpt that I absolutely loved. Do you want me to go just do that? Yeah. Okay. So um, actually, I'll kind of keep. I'll start at the top of the page. Mirabel does not does most of the talking, so they end up going on a date. Mm-hmm. Again, that's with this is the very next page, mm-hmm. or almost a page and a half later. That's how much synopsis this is kind of up if you haven't gotten it already michelle does not or does most of the M- michelle jesus christ take all the drinks <laughs> mirabelle does most of the talking and jeremy listens intently without saying much later mirabelle will remember the dinner as the time she first found him to be very interesting on the wa- which damn boy you suck Ooh. yeah on the walk home as they warm up to each other and the night Mirabel recites the litany of reasons for her move leaving out the most important one and gets down to a final summation I'm fixing myself I'm fixing myself too says Jeremy and they know they will forever have something to talk about and Jesus Christ that is such a good a matter of fact and this is okay while Jeremy dates Mirabel and makes tiny inroads into her, Ray continue, continues to occasionally see her. In an act of self-preservation, she no longer makes love to him, and because he finally cares about her fully, he doesn't try. Mirabel takes months to accept Jeremy, and Jeremy patiently waits, and as he stands by, his feelings for Mirabel grows. 
One night she cries in his arms when a re- recollection of Ray flirts with her memory, and he holds her and doesn't say a word. Where this insight comes from as he courts her, he doesn't even really know. It might have been that he was ready to grow up, and the knowledge was already in him, like a dormant gene. Whatever it is, she is the perfect recipient of his attention, and he is the perfect recipient of her tenderness. Unlike Ray Porter, his love is fearless and without reservation. As Jeremy offers her more of his heart, she offers equal parts of herself in return, trying not to cry. One night sooner than she would have liked, which is which made it irresistible. They make love for the second time in two years, but this time Jeremy holds her for a long, long while, and they connect in a deep and profound way. At this point, Jeremy surpasses Mr. Ray Porter as a lover of Mirabelle because as clumsy as he is, what he offers her is tender and true. Oh, that night coming up for air from the unexpected love he is falling in. He gives some opinions on Twitter wholesaling that Mirabelle secretly calls the second or second oration. <laughs> that's right. Cause he, that's something he does when they first make it. He starts ranting and it's an oration of mm-hmm. whatever. After he nods off, she pokes her forefinger into his closed fist and falls asleep. <laughs> Their union is the kind of perfect mismatch that makes for long relationships. She is smarter than he is, but Jeremy is in love with his own bright ideas, and the enthusiasm he shows for them inflects Mary Bell and pushes her forward into the world of drawing for money. She begins to enjoy tolerating his enthusiastic outspurts. This is her gift to him. Yes. Sometimes they lie in bed and Mirabel relates the entire plot of a Victorian novel and Jeremy is so captivated and engrossed that he believes the events in the story are happening to him right now. Again, to him. Oh, Damn. God. And that's not like the fucking end. We got three pages left to go. Yeah. Three pages left to go. And it's so fucking I think, good. Because, I mean, we kind of touched on this at the beginning. But, I mean, everyone, uh, all the main characters in this, like, show this kind of just profound loneliness. Yes. Even when they're surrounded with Ugh. other people. And I think that the ending of this... And I, I've read, I've read criticisms that the happy ending kind of comes out of left field, which I don't necessarily agree with because it shows that it, people yeah. can evolve. It does, and it you know it shows that the two of them with that like the, those those two lines of I'm fixing myself, I'm fixing myself too. I think it kind of helps the reader realize that you know people. There are no perfect people. People are always going to be evolving and changing, right? Hopefully for the better, but you never know. Yeah. But the fact that they are able to you know, to tell each other that they're constantly trying to better themselves. Yeah. I think helps the two of them realize that they, you know, will forever kind of have this connection of wanting to be better, more realized people. And I think that that kind of helps break up the loneliness that they've both felt up until now. Uh, do you mind if I just finish this? Please. Uh, I mean, I mean, because it it actually speaks a lot for Ray. I feel like Ray more than anyone is, and I understandably he should. Uh, the way we kind of talk is being a. I mean, we're trying to say that he's a rounded character, but he sounds like a dude sleeping with a young woman mm-hmm. and breaking her heart. Mm-hmm. So this is kind of his growth. Um, so as you heard in the intro, lots of spoilers here, people. So why read the book when we read it to you? Uh, but no, seriously, Michelle informs Ray that though she is cautious, perhaps Michelle. she has met some... Er- did I say it again? You did. Fuck! Me and the goat ass. God damn it. Fuck it. Just, you know what? Finish your drink. Just do it now, but don't drink any more after that because... You, you need that's, to drive home. You need to drive home and also... Jesus. <laughs> Michelle informs, I did it on purpose that time, (laughs) informs Ray that she is cautious, perhaps she has met somebody. I tell him about my medication and he doesn't care, she says. This is the moment Ray has always known is coming when she succumbs to the unrestricted, unbounded, and free-flowing passion of someone who is her peer. In spite of its predictability, he still feels this moment as a loss, and a curious one. How is it possible to miss a woman who you kept at a distance so that when she is gone, you would not miss her? Ray also wonders why is it she and not he who has met someone accidentally in a laundromat, someone who stumbles into your life and forever alters it. But just three months later, it happens to Ray. It isn't a laundromat since he hasn't seen one in 30 years, but rather a dinner party. A 45-year-old woman divorced with two children touches his heart and then breaks it flat. It is then Ray's turn to experience Maribel's despair, to see its walls and collars. Only then does he realize what he has done to Maribel, how wanting a square inch of her and not all of her has damaged them both, and how he cannot justify his actions except that, well, it was, a, it was life. 
Jeremy and Mirabelle, who are not living together but are close to it, have shorter and shorter separations as he commutes south and north. Mirabelle and Ray continue to talk weekly or more, and they begin to be able to discuss the details of each other's romantic lives. On the phone, Mirabelle mentions that she wants to fly home to Vermont for a three-day weekend. She does not ask him for money. She never does, but Ray is always forthcoming when he senses her need. This time, however, he does not volunteer the dough, and they chat up and hang, chat on and hang up. He needs to sort something out. As he stands on his balcony overlooking Los Angeles in the dusky orange sunset, Ray ponders his continuing concern for Mirabelle. If she is no longer seeing him, if she is now with someone new, wouldn't it be the new man's responsibility to pay for the odd necessity? Ray always had paid. He saw it as a gift to her, but now it's over. Yet he is still compelled to help her. Why? He turns his power of analysis away from the logic of symbols and towards the churning subconscious. He strips his questions down to their barest form, and he finds the single unifying theme of his contradictory feelings. He suddenly knows why he feels the way he does about her, why she still touches him, and why, at regular and unpredictable intervals, he wonders where she is and how she is doing. He has become her parent, and she his child. He sees finally that as much as he believed he was imposing his will on her, she was also imposing her need on him, and that their two dispositions interlocked, and the consequence was a mutual education. Her experience, he experienced a relationship in which he was the sole responsible party, and he notes its failures. She found someone to guide her through the next level of her life. Mirabelle, standing on uneasy legs, now feeling the warmth of her first mature reciprocal love, has broken away from him. But he knows like, that like a parent, he will be there for her forever. Some nights alone, he thinks of her, and some nights alone, he thinks of him, or she thinks of him. Some nights, these thoughts, separated by miles and time zones, occur at the same objective moment, and Ray and Mirabelle are connected without ever knowing it. One night, he will think of her as he looks into the eyes of someone new, searching for two qualities that Mirabel defined for him, loyalty and acceptance. Mirabel, far away and in Jeremy's embrace, knows that what had been lost is now regained. Months later, after the hard edges of their breakup had smoothed into forgetfulness, Mirabelle speaks with Ray Porter on the phone. She tells him about her new life and how he hears the fresh delight in her voice. She tells him, I feel like I really belong here. For the first time, I feel like I really belong. She underplays Jeremy's place in her heart as she thinks it might hurt Ray. She mentions that she continues to draw and sell with a positive review and art news to her credit. They reminisce about the affair, and she tells him how he helped her and how he tells her how she helped him. Then he apologizes for the way he handled everything. Oh, no, don't, she corrects him. It's pain that changes our lives. And there is a pause, and neither speaks. Then Mirabelle says, I took the gloves to Vermont and stored them in my memory box. My mother asked me what they were, but I kept them to myself. And here in my bedroom, in my private drawer, I keep a photo of you. Um, that's something we didn't touch on, too, but you didn't think it was going to come back. You thought it would, but then it didn't. Um, but then it does. In the last page, which is she is at the salon getting ready or something like that, and she hears this woman saying, it's pain that changes her lives. Because it almost becomes she's annoyed by a very overweight woman. It goes into a lot of detail on mm-hmm. the folds of her fat spilling over into the chair, um, kind of comically. And then she hears that, and she's like, huh, what is that? No. And then she's like, oh, it does. It's really good. You get life lessons from the strangest places. Yeah. Fuck Steve Martin. God damn it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I read this again. Again, the first time it took me a, like a week, but mm-hmm. the second time I read this all in one night. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, cause, and, and and this is it got to the point where, as you could tell, after page 63, I stopped taking notes, mm-hmm. uh, really, because I was just so engrossed in, in what was... Did you just get to enjoying it after a while? Really, yeah. Um, and it does... This holds up after... And I, it's been like, what, five, ten years since I've read this? I mean, it, no, yeah, it has to be. Um, it holds up very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like this might be my third time reading it. I don't know. I feel like I read it again right before the movie came out. Mm-hmm. Um and then after that, I think I went and got The Pleasure of My Company, which um, is a little bit more of a full book in terms of writing style, mm-hmm. but, um, but it still comes close to that same kind of... And actually, you know how Ray Porter talks about how he has figures and analytics running through his mind? I said it at the end, but there's a lot of time where he talks about that in the book, too. Yes. Um, earlier when he, they're introducing him. Uh, I feel like Steve Martin has that in real life because mm-hmm. Pleasure of My Company, the character does that. Mm-hmm. And then you see his breakdown of things. Of matter of fact, how all the lights are set up in the room in his house. Mm-hmm. It's a weird thing, and you're going, "What the 
fuck is going on? Yeah. But that's for if we ever want to do that one, which it I, is on my pile. I, yeah. I, I will yeah. gladly. Um, but so, uh, sorry. Did you have any other thought? Because we, we were just. This is a I, fucking piece of shit silhouette. <laughs> you can knock that shit. Don't actually don't. That I would die. I would get murdered. I would get murdered by my wife. <laughs> um, we have to specify on my table. We have a silhouette cameo. It's a device where you can uh, do um, vinyl printing. Mm-hmm. <sighs> my wife is getting into that now, and she has it on the table because um, this is a shared workspace. As uh, you do. As you do. Uh, yeah, and it's, but K- poor Kyle is kind of like sandwiched in between this <laughs> fucking hunk of a device. No, Hun- she doesn't listen to this, so it's okay. But if it would break. I uh, there would, would catch, be no there would be no more podcasts. Catch, I would be dead. You catch some help. I would catch. Some, that's a very light term. Um, <laughs> I would be I, I would be in hell and be, dead. You would be no more. I would be no. I have ceased to be. Gone to meet my maker. <laughs> uh, breath of life. He rest in peace. Uh, uh, no, I just I really really like I said earlier. I loved this book and I really yeah. I really appreciated it. its um, just kind of the way that he framed you know, depression and yes. mental illness. Like, I thought it was so succinctly done. And I kind of wish I found something that, I mean, we kind of touched on in one of the readings where it, about the gear shifting. Yes. And there's, I think, a little bit before that where they talk about how she's, they don't go too far into it. They just go into her medication more than anything. Mm-hmm. And she calls off one day and lies to her manager. Yeah. And... You, she, yeah, she kind of feels shitty about it, but she doesn't. Yeah. And uh, which just spends all day in bed, like staring at the wall. Which yeah, I think it's just it's such it's good little snippets like that that kind of shows you like I think an innate understanding of how that kind of mm-hmm. thing can affect your day to day. Yeah, and I also yeah, especially with the gear shifting thing, like that is something that I feel like on a day to day on a deep personal level. Like there are nights where I'm out and I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling like really on tonight and like really witty and funny, and then there are nights where I'm a little more low key and just kind of kind of low key. The, <laughs> Sorry, and then sort of take like the background and just. You know, Let me take of, your very nice, serious observe. moment and just shit all over it with a joke. Oh, girl, it's fine. When we get to the poor <laughs> Ragnarok, I'm going to be the grossest fangirl in the world. So oh, no, it's okay. Get but, ready. But, but, but I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, actually, we might have a full house for that one because I originally said three people because that's my new thing because, I mean, we had a lot of people for the Red Room one, which was amazing and which you should still check out. You you are awesome in it, by the way. I don't think I've got officially... I told them, but I didn't just tell you because you were, you were in Paris yeah. and then when I did see you, it was party time. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh yeah, you're fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, so I haven't watched tonight's episode because when we're recording this, it's Monday night. Yes, it so just a new episode two at, hours at, ago. That's yes, right. So yeah. if you throw it out there, you want to check it out. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash Red Roof Series, which I'll have yeah. it in the show notes yeah. again. Um, and uh, this episode tonight is, uh, the, or the ones, episode five of is one of my favorite outfits that I wear in the series. Nice. Well, actually, the yeah, the first time I see you, you have like a, a interesting business, like a... <laughs> We called it my Ellen look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah. I, I mean, that does encapsulate perfectly. Thank you. The Ellen look, yeah. But, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I really get back to the book. <laughs> I absolutely freaking adored this book. The movie, like, to touch on it really quickly. Yeah, yeah, sure. I did really, I liked the movie, and I feel like the, it followed the book pretty well, and it kind of expanded on some certain, like, yeah. little snippets and... I, and I mean, like I like I kind of said um, off mic earlier, uh, I, folks. I can't explain why. I really can't. It, happens. it just is something. I have such a visceral, like deep seated hate of Jason Schwartzman. I don't know what it is. I think it's just the way his face looks, or something. Like I just and. I just I, I feel like if I were ever around him in person, I would get really uncomfortable and need to leave the room. But. In this movie, he actually, like, came across as a semi-okay guy. And I don't know if it's just the characters he plays in movies, but I freaking hate, he, Jason, I hate Jason Schwartzman. And I feel bad about it, because I know he is a very talented actor. And he's a good musician, like, too. He's a good musician, and I'm not denying that. But it's just something about his general demeanor and presence just really rubs me the wrong way. Uh, so, in relation to that, he's not in this movie, but I feel the same way about Amy Poehler. 
I have big. no idea. And I know she's talented. I know she's funny. But that's why I can't watch Parks and Rec. Mm-hmm. Because she's the lead mm-hmm. and she's the Michael Scott character. And even though they focus on, like, you know, the Chris Pratt character and the Aziz. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, his character and, and Audrey. We, we touched on this a long time ago, but I actually was not a huge Amy, po- Amy Poehler fan when, when she was on SNL. I was, I was not a huge fan of her because I thought that she was way overused. Parks and Rec, though, changed my mind about her. So, <sighs> but, but, I, but I get your feeling. No, you know, exactly. It's, it's kind of like how some, the way some people feel about Jennifer Lawrence or any yeah. any, any actor or actress. Our of friend the Scott cannot stand Jennifer Lawrence. And our friend Lawrence. Kat absolutely adores Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. I know. Lawrence. But I think we're going to do, at some point, i got to watch it before I feel like it's going to leave theater soon. I need mm-hmm. to watch it as mother. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, I've been trying to get Kat on the show forever. As a matter of fact, every time she... She does, she read something for us. I think uh, was it Guardians. Yeah, it was Guardians. Yeah, and but I think she wanted to do Spider Man or she wanted to do another one, and then she couldn't. Something happened. She she overbooked herself. She's a busy lady. She is. She is. Um, and so when she first off when she came to the Red Room one, I was so excited. Mm-hmm. But then um, we actually got into a. That's the one thing you miss. Casey was next to me and my wife. Um, and then Kat was in the table behind us because we were so big they had to split us up. Mm-hmm. Um, but and we just started talking Marvel movies yeah. right there and. I mean, it was so much fun. So I'm really looking forward to it. But I just said, I know it says it's booked. You should just come anyway. And Nick is almost kind of like if Nick Ray from So Long Story isn't doing the the Marvel movies with us or he, he doesn't try to. I was just like, and I did put in there three people and it's tagged out. Yeah. You want to be back up, whatever. So uh, I just I saw I just tagged both of them. I was like, you guys should just come. But partially, yeah, like under the table, you're like, well, you should just come over anyway. Because yeah, you know dear that God. Be hilarious. Yeah, hashtag too many cooks, but who, hashtag <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, but uh, where were we, where were we going? Uh, I don't know. We were uh, talking about the movie a little bit. Oh yeah, movie movie Schwarzman, and I didn't like um, Amy Poehler, mm-hmm. and in the same way, and I don't know why. Uh, I like yeah. She shows up in a movie for half a second. I just tend to then hate the movie. Like <laughs> Blades of Fury, she's not. Even, she's the bad guy, but her and Will Arnett are not in the movie that long. They're maybe mm-hmm. fifteen minutes, mm-hmm. and I just, it just, I yeah. don't know why. It's uh, yeah. It's, I, isn't it weird? I think, I think it's no, it isn't. But I think it speaks to this movie's credit. And like the movie is okay. That's true. I, I actually, I you know, like most book nerds, I really, I, I actually like the book better than the movie. Oh yeah. But I think that to the movie's credit, they actually do frame. Jason Schwartzman and the Jeremy character in a way that like you yeah know, it's it, it works really well and I actually left the theater like not wanting to like you well, know rip my own eyes we, out. we didn't we didn't talk about how um, it's not super important but like because again it's done within a not even a page of what happened to him which is when he went on the road uh, he did ask for a suit mm-hmm. that was part of his agreement mm-hmm. he's like don't pay me anything just give me I just need a nice suit. Need a nice suit so I can look professional on the road, and that's kind of it. And also, it is kind of funny too. He's like, "What do you want?" He's like, it, and, and Martin writes it as almost like he didn't expect to get this far. Yeah, <laughs> and so he doesn't know. So he's like, "A new suit?" It's almost a question, and some commission, perhaps, and com- commission, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah, because he, again, he's never thought of it. Because again, that's, Jeremy doesn't really think things through at the time, not really. And then it's kind of amazing because what happens is you know he starts listening to these like Buddhist meditation tapes on the bus on from the bus. from the band members mm-hmm. and then he goes out into the world and starts picking up self-help books mm-hmm. like mad and that's all he listens to mm-hmm. and you're just like and then it changes him mm-hmm. and and i think that's interesting too i feel like normally we live in a very self-help world mm-hmm. But we don't really learn or change, or not really. We read it, but it kind of goes in one ear and goes out the other. Right. And to be fair, it's also ch- hard to change. Mm-hmm. Like, I think weight loss is a big example of that. Like, Absolutely. I remember when I was little, I would listen to, you know, the boom, 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 boom. And you hear in the background, like, eat right, <laughs> eat vegetables. <laughs> Say no to pizza. <laughs> like this is weird stuff. But like, but you hear Enya. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's the same thing. But it, at some point, it goes in out one ear and goes out the other. You don't mean to. Like you remember it, but then you're not. It's hard to put it into practice. And that goes with anything. And, and that's just with eating habits. Mm-hmm. Now you're trying to change how your brain works. Yeah. Well, you and know, that's, it, it, it kind of goes back to you know my mom, who you know I'm a little biased, but I think is the smartest person in the world told me when I was very young, like, you can never expect to be able to change someone. They Mm -hmm. have to want to change for themselves. Yeah. And I think that that actually is reflected in this book in some ways very well, because, you know, it's him listening to these tapes and having a realization. So he goes and actively seeks out these things instead of having a problem. Like, I feel like most people seek out self-help books when they're like, oh, you know, this isn't going right for me. Maybe if I read this book, it'll all turn around. Instead the of, secret. Mm-hmm, getting the secret. Jesus and I think it, it kind of, 
it for him it stems from actively wanting to improve himself instead of just trying to yeah. find a silver bullet or a and, quick or a quick fix. And he doesn't know what's wrong either. I th- and I think that's inter- in the thing answer we read, which we both loved. I'm fixing myself. I'm fixing myself too. And they don't really know officially what's wrong. They have hints of what it is. Mm-hmm. I think Jeremy stumbled into his. Mirabel kind of knows. She doesn't know the root of it necessarily, even though the book kind of touches on what it could be. But you know, they they are both at this level, and they're willing to. They can have something to talk about, mm-hmm. and that's why forever they. It's it's. Oh man. Um, yeah, the ending of that book is really beautiful. It's, it really is, and and also I I like it too because I feel I kind of want to beat the fuck out of the person that says it's two coincidences because that's the thing is life is made of weird coincidences mm-hmm. like honestly when once Jeremy left that first half I never thought we'd fucking see him again mm-hmm. I thought this is just showing an example of what she's looking for and what mm-hmm. she's not looking for we already know she wants someone to hold her after but is, coitus but it's very obvious um, an example of what is not going to be right for her at this time that's true as well. And then Ray comes in with a different... He's not right for her, but he is in a different way for the moment, for right now. Mm-hmm. And then, and so again, you, you at, honestly, at this point, at the, the middle point of the book, I was like, Ray's going to realize what he did wrong, and he'll fix it, or they'll just separate and they'll live happily ever, ever after, not together. Mm-hmm. And it ends up being true, but then, yeah, then Jeremy comes back, and you're like... Well, and I think it's also a good point, like, in the kind of interlude between Jeremy, like, and her dating, and mm-hmm. her moving to San Francisco, she does date a few people, but has, like... In, oh, yeah, in they the talk book, about that, and in, yes. the, and in the book, she has that realization about how she shouldn't freely give her body to just anyone because, you know, she has an inkling that she wants some cuddling after some Yeah, sexing. well, there is... Um, <laughs> But I mean, oh my God! Yes. Yeah, and you know, I think that that kind of shows like a good step for her of trying to you know actively evolve and fix herself, as she says. Yes, I mean, oh my God! Okay. But yeah, uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to desperately it, find because I really much, like it. It's kind of funny how much is like crammed into these 130 pages. No, and right? that it, it <laughs> is, and and that is really. Uh, yeah, okay, I think I found it. Another plus, the San Francisco art scene is livelier than the intermittent one in L.A. Every third night, there's something going on somewhere which she can either attend or pass up and curl up in her own bed. The gallery action puts her in center of the glut of testosterone. Mirabelle is a ripe, relative virgin, and her romantic life starts badly. At an art opening, she meets an artist named Carlo, who courts her for a month, fucks her several times, and leaves her cruelly. She calls him on the phone. He says he is on the other line, and that he will call her back, but then he never does. Um, ever. She summarizes and explains this event to herself, not by saying that she is yet again unwanted, but that she has learned something about her own decisions. She has learned that her body is precious, and it must be offered carelessly ever again as it holds direct connection to her heart. She sheathes herself in a protective envelope of caution and learns never to give away more than is being given to her. The main disaster of this brief romance accomplishes something else, too. Mirabel is able to shift her anger from Ray to Carlo, and Ray is then able to become just a friend. And and it kind of goes in more to this and goes into the, the Ray thing, but I mean that's the big. I think it's a very pivotal moment for her. <sighs> yes, very. Well, I mean, her even going to San Francisco is is the start of the is is the actually I think I'm not even going to try to find because it it's like one line but thing. It's, it's, it's kind of the impetus of her, you know, realizing that something needs. It's it truly is the beginning some, of the end. Yes, yeah, for Ray. Needs to change. Yes. yes, and and she realizes that in Vermont with her parents, I think, right. Uh, where she goes up to her parents the second or third time, mm-hmm. she's just like, I'm going to go out to San Francisco. And I think she just leaves. And yeah, and actually, no, I'm I'm getting those confused. I thought that her parents were involved somehow, and they were just like, I what? think she talks to her dad for a little bit to ask if he got into, t- oh, into that's touch with what a friend it was. or something. But yeah, I think it's definitely... I, I just kind of love, like, you know, the growth and involvement that's shown in such a short amount of time because it can happen that quickly, you know. And it like is. you said, like, people can just, like you said, life is full of coincidences. Like, you can just stumble into someone's life and be sitting next to them one day. And then, the fact you know, I'm married is a good example. And then months later, yeah, yes. you're suddenly in a thing that mm-hmm. you never expected. Yes. Which is kind of nice. So I guess maybe, and again, I felt that way before we got married, mm-hmm. but I, I, I mean, I just feel like in further in trips. So fuck you, buddy, who reviewed that. You're a piece of shit. 
fuck you up. You know, um, suck you know, a Terry book, fold. Book reviewers, they just they read everything. Oh, some probably, book reviewers are assholes. All reviewers are assholes. Well, <laughs> except for <laughs> here at the Good, the Bad, and the Geeky. For these um, here. You know, but to be fair, I don't have. I am an unlicensed hmm. to quote a Jason Schwartzman project. I am an unlicensed. <laughs> no, he said. Uh, Again, if you don't like it, you won't like Jason Schwartzman. If you don't like Jason Schwartzman, you might not like it, but he, uh, bored to death. Mm-hmm. He plays an unlicensed... Yeah, he plays yeah. an unlicensed private detective. He goes... And he constantly says that so he won't get in trouble from the cops because yeah. the first episode, he gets in trouble from the cops. Yeah. So he's like, I'm an unlicensed private detective. I'm an unlicensed critic. Mm-hmm. I don't have a degree on my wall that says Nick movie reviewer or book reviewer or whatever few do <laughs> few, yeah that's true and in, in very few honestly live up to the hype they deserve I honestly I, god I isn't that weird Roger Ebert I sincerely mourned his loss for criticism um, mm-hmm. I don't know anyway that's a so horrible. is there anything about this book that you didn't like though oh oh Jesus Christ why well, why know. we gotta do both sides yeah. come on yeah, yeah, yeah fuck yeah, bro. Yeah. Oh, we got a very nice email from uh, someone named Stephen, uh, who said that we should go. Uh, we should replace the morning show on Sunny ninety five. Which my first thought is that's not a compliment. And then he goes, if anything, for alone the dueling Romanos. And I had to go back and listen to. It. I was like, did we do a? Lo- I feel like, like I did seconds. for five seconds. But then you did, and then we did it again right at the very end. And I was just like. <laughs> All right, come for the big sick review. Stay for the dueling Sleep Romanos. Romanos. Um, that's going to be our new like yeah, Christmas Carol. I am. Like, that's that's right. Uh, uh. uh, okay, honestly, uh, okay. This is the first time I read it. Thought process. I, I did. I wanted more conversations. Mm-hmm. Well, I know you said from the very beginning, like you wanted it. You wanted more, uh, more of a fleshed out. Like I think a full novel, and this is more of a, no- yeah. a novella. This is a novella, but even I've read other novellas, and they feel like full stories. Yeah. This again, but it, as you said, and I never thought of it this way. But again, even after I read it, it didn't bother me. I actually, when I read this time, it was pure pleasure. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I guess was if I was because I knew where it was going, I was waiting for the other shoes to drop, mm-hmm. and I was getting antsy. Okay. But then once the actually around page sixty three. My last note. That's why I was just like, "Oh fuck!" I just gotta keep reading. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, though, it was like, "What's?" I don't remember this part, but I do. What's going on? I, it's. I don't really. I can't think of something right now that really bothers me about this. But you, this is the first time I read for you. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I loved it from cover to cover, pretty yeah. much. Like I don't, and it's been a, a little bit since I've read it now. Um, but I. Honestly, like, was very enthralled from the beginning to the end. And yeah. kind of, you know, you get that kind of amazing swell in your chest right when you finish a really good book. And yes. you, know, just, you have that really, like, satisfying kind of like, all right, yeah, that was awesome. And I definitely felt that, like, tenfold with this story. Yeah, and I feel like in a good indie movie, too, or a movie that feels like an indie movie, it, you get the same feeling, too. Like, okay... This is a bad example. Manchester by the Sea. Have you seen that? Um, seen or that. What about Google Hunting? Have you seen Google Hunting? It's might have been years, but... Yes, you have. That was no, that. I haven't. What? Yes. Oh, we need to do a podcast on this. This is another <laughs> one where we talk ourselves into a new episode. But um, that is one of my... F- okay, now, I should preface this. We should not watch this movie together. Uh, <laughs> because uh, we talked about this before where I, I will probably be... I was like, do you like it? Because it's one of my favorite watching movies ever. Watch the movie. Yeah, I'll be watching you watch the movie, and that's just not cool. Uh... <laughs> Uh, oh Jesus! Uh, that's up there with like my my, my all favorite movies. Okay. But but if you, I'm trying to think of a movie similar to that where it's like just very fucking bittersweet and beautiful. And I kind of feel like the movie not so much. The book though, I'm just like, oh man, that's some fucking deep shit. Mm-hmm. I just, but oh, it's so good. And then, but it's so oh yeah oh. And then you just start, you're just overcome with the flow of emotion from it, <laughs> and it's so great. Obviously, that's how I feel about Good Will Hunting. You don't have to feel that way. It's okay. I just worry that it's going to be like, you know... Now I've overhyped it for not you. Even, not even that. It's just, it's kind of one of those, like, uh, I used... I had a roommate mm. in my, uh, like, early 20s mm-hmm. who had never seen any Monty Python. At none. And he refused to watch it because he knew so many of the references already from being alive oh. in, in modern culture that it's... He figured that he would just kind of hate it on principle, which I kind of get... And yeah. I'm not saying it'll be the same thing with, you know, with with a Goodwill Hunting, but, you know, like, oh, how do you like dem apples? Like, I know that kind of stuff from the movie. That, oh, man, it's I know. Like, it's like when you watch um, when you watch The Simpsons growing up, and then, like, later yeah. on you see everything that actually 
that goes into the references. Like when I finally saw The Godfather one and two. Oh yeah. Then I was like, oh, that's where that comes from. So I'm sure. Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably go in with kind of a chip on my shoulder about it though. <sighs> Man, why well, I I throwing it out there. I hope that you go in and you come out with the chip ch- chipped away, the block chipped away. <laughs> but it's okay if you didn't. I understand. But that's something else we will totally then do. We'll get there. Jesus God. Uh, no, I can't think of anything. Oh, you know what? I don't like the picture on the book. There's something negative. <laughs> I don't like the picture on the book. That does Although, not look like it's Maribel. Funny, when you were reading it and reading like her meeting Ray, it actually what she's doing in the picture on the on the front cover. That is true. Kind of what she's doing when he walks up, like her, like you know, putting a her calf behind her foot and scratching it or whatever. Yeah. I, I do like that it, this is from the movie. I remember they, they did that and I remember watching the movie at the time going this, they're taking a lot of time to focus on her fucking stretching her legs and then when I read it again I was like oh yeah she kind of fucking does that a lot. Like that's part of her that's that's her introduction really. I mean her real introduction. They, they introduce her but then they talk about what she, how she's sitting, leaning on the counter mm-hmm. and how she's yeah and But I mean the, the from from the Back the girl that is on this cover she reminds almost. me more of like a Lisa than a Mirabelle. Thank you. That's that's yes yes. And look, and there's nothing wrong with people who look like a Lisa mm-hmm. and that have the same emotional core as a Mirabelle or a Michelle in my case. <laughs> uh, but it just doesn't look right. It looks like a Lisa, and that bothers me. But yeah, uh, if you you'll see the cover on the, our website, go to gbgpodcast.com, mm. and also check out the show notes where you can see other uh, plugs and stuff. But um, Oh, yeah, sorry. What other things did you not like? No, you enjoyed it. Yeah, you didn't have any I've either. Much, I've, I can't think of any fault that I can find with it. Um, I mean, it's so it's so concisely written, and you know, it, I know that you and I had the kind of uh, difference of opinion on the way it was structured, but I really enjoyed yeah. it personally because it you know it kind of hits the finer points and sort of treats it more like sort of a faded memory, which they refer to toward the and end. Of this I, book. And, and again, and I I never even after they said that. I never would have considered it like a memory, which actually makes it even better. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, everyone, go buy Shop Girl. It was the New York Times bestseller written by Steve Martin. It's a novella. They probably have the really shitty movie poster now as the cover. Mm-hmm. We're sorry about that. Unless you go to Half Price Books or some other yeah. like, secondhand bookshop, which is where I got my copy. Right. And you can see the original cover on our website if you'd like to know the difference. And are you are like Kyle and kind of me, too, where you're just like, fuck that new movie cover. I want the original. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Shop Girl by Steve Martin. Uh, thanks for listening. <laughs>